All right, I want to get into this message today. I'm excited about this message. It's a little bit different. We might uh, split some hairs today, uh, which is totally okay. It's fun stuff to talk about. And just fair warning, it's going to look like I'm going to take a hard left-hand turn, go way out into left field, away from the Fruit of the Spirit series, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up the Fruit of the Spirit today. We're going to make a big left-hand turn, and then I promise we're going to come back. It's not by accident. So are you guys ready? Here we go. Fruit part 17. Are you like, really? Did it take him 17 weeks to get through nine fruit of the Spirit? Yes, it sure did. Okay? And I slimmed it down. No, I'm just kidding. But our message uh, title for today is A Choosy God Chooses You. Now, who can figure out where I got that from? What's, what's the slogan? Choosy Moms. Choose GIF. All right. So I wanted to say choosy gods choose GIF because that goes better, but there's not many gods. There's only one God, and I'm like, that doesn't really make sense. So a choosy God chooses you. Now, when I say a choosy God, I don't mean that God is choosy like he selects specific people. It's more like he wants to choose us. That is his desire to have us, and we will get probably farther into that today than you really want to, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, All right, let's think back. For some of us, it will be way, way back, maybe in elementary school. And uh, maybe, remember when, like, you were at recess or PE, and two team captains got picked, and you had to line up? You know, some of you guys are like, oh, man, yes. I know exactly what you're talking, and I hated that time. That was me. Okay. So everybody had to line up, and the team captains had to pick, and they had to choose who was going to be on their team. Now, I know you guys may find this super hard to believe, okay? I was not, I think, ever the guy chosen first. I know, I know, I know. It's very hard to believe. I was usually the guy chosen first last or more towards the end and I'm like really you're choosing the kid that's sleeping over in the corner before me that was just me okay I I was I was really small growing up still obviously not a big guy but I didn't get chosen at least first a whole lot maybe you did maybe you were like like the person who was like first chosen every time that felt good didn't it I mean, I don't know, but I've heard it feels really, really good to be chosen. Or, you know, like there's the NFL draft and, or, you know, any of those, and and you get chosen first or, you know, in the first round. And I mean, that's a big deal. Maybe in your office, maybe the boss is putting together a special team because there's a really big, important project that needs to happen. And they pick you to be on that team because you have a very special set of skills and you were chosen specifically to be on that team because of something that you bring to the table. That's a really, really good feeling, isn't it? Did you know that when you get chosen for things like that, when you, when you get this excitement in you and your body actually releases dopamine and serotonin, these, these things, these hormones in us that make us excited, they make us more motivated, and they, they make us more all in. That's an actual chemical reaction that happens in our bodies when we're chosen for specific things like that. Now, not to be too cheesy or too churchy, but I just want to bring something to the forefront here. Do you realize that the God of all creation, like the creator and sustainer of all things, like he spoke everything into existence, do you realize that that very same God chose you to be on his team? That ought to blow us away. But we just kind of were like, "Ah, yeah, yeah, I know. No way. Like, there's 7 billion people on the earth, and there's been how many billion before us? And, like, he knows you, and he knows me, and he knows the numbers of hairs on my head, and, 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 you, and like, he knows everything about us, and he cares about us that much. He chose us. That ought to be a no-way moment. 
Talk about dopamine and serotonin being released. I mean, we should be freaking out about that, that that very same God would want us. When we started out this Fruit of the series, uh, Fruit of the Spirit series, we had a key statement. And I just want to run through a few of the things that we have learned to get into this. Our key statement was, true followers of Jesus will be identified by fruit and sanctification. Now, hopefully, after 16 weeks so far of this, I don't have to explain what fruit is. I really, if you're new, if you're, if you're just showing up today for the first time, or you've only been here a couple times, you get a pass. For you guys who have been here for most of these 16 weeks already, if you don't know what fruit is by now, I don't know what to tell you, okay? So that's the fruit. And then the sanctification is something that we talk about all the time. That's that process that we need to be going through to look more and more and more like Jesus. We're never going to arrive at Jesus' status, but our job, our goal is to look more and more and more like Jesus, to model our lives after Jesus. So a true follower of Jesus, you should be able to look at them, and yes, we still mess up and we still do dumb things, but we ought to be able to look at them or each other and, and observe some of our daily lives and say, there's something different about that person. Have you ever had that said to you? That's a really, really big compliment. I don't know what it is, but there's just something different about it. Now, I can imagine many of you have had that said to you, but I'm talking about the Jesus part of, of being told you're different. They say, there, there's just, you know, when you went through that hardship last year, I watched you and somehow you still had joy in your life. Like, like yes, it was difficult and you, you mourned, and, but, but like, there's just something different about you. And that's what true followers of Jesus ought to look like. We still struggle with things, like I said, like Paul in Romans chapter seven. The apostle Paul, he's like, what I want to do, I don't do. But what I don't wanna do, I do. Like, like I'm, I'm a mess. Even the apostle Paul messed up and things like that. So we say, why don't we just try harder, right? Why don't we just try to produce fruit in our lives? Why don't we just do better? It's because we can't. We can't. It's the presence of God in our lives. And when we allow God to work in our lives, that's when true change happens. Hosea 14.8 says, your fruitfulness comes from me. Not from anything else. God's spirit. That's why it's called the fruit of the spirit. Glad you guys got that. I'd be in really big trouble if you didn't. Your fruitfulness comes from me. That's God saying that. It's like you can't do it on your own. But see, there's a little bit of tension in God's word at times, and I love that. I love it when we read something and it's so clear one way, and then we read something else and it sounds a little bit different. And what we don't need to do, church, is to run and say, well, that's a contradiction in God's word. No, there probably means something that we need to dig into a little more, and I love doing that. Here's John 15, 8, which we're going to be in John 15 today if you want to start flipping over there. It says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. See, now there it kind of sounds like we're supposed to do it. So it's, it's kind of like, well, what exactly is it? It's the fruit of the Spirit. God produces it in our lives, but we're supposed to do it, but not by trying harder. We can't produce more fruit because we just, I'm just going to try to do that. It doesn't work like that. We're naturally driven by our flesh. Does anybody remember the Greek word for flesh? We talked about it many, many weeks ago. What was it? Started with an S. Sarks. I heard somebody say it, and you're like, I think it's sarks. Sarks. And the, the Greek word sarks, it refers to the sinful state of human beings often presented as a power in opposition to the spirit. So you've got to get this. This is really important. Our sarks, our flesh, the you, what makes up you, okay? That is in opposition to God working in us. We have a problem, don't we? 
Because we're trying to follow God, but the us of us is going against that. So what do we have to do? We have to be constantly mindful that, hey, God, I want to follow you. I don't want to follow me. I want to follow you, God. Your sarks, your flesh, longs after evil desires. Jeremiah 17, 9. I love this verse. We read it all the time. The heart, and the, the, that heart is the eunice of you. That's your spirit. That's, that's your, your characteristics that make of you. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We kind of have something going against us, don't we? So if we want to be true followers of Jesus, if we want to follow God like we are supposed to, there's going to be a battle inside of us constantly. And we have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, that process of sanctification constantly. And you may say, well, Trev, you're being a little bit negative, okay? You're making it sound like there's almost no hope. Guess what? There's no hope. Sorry. There's no hope unless you fully rely on God and his spirit working in you because we cannot produce fruit without God's help, without God constantly being in our lives. Galatians 5, 16, here's one of our biggest verses. So I say, Paul would say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. God's spirit working in us will produce all of those fruit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those fruit of the Spirit that we've been looking at for so many weeks, God's Spirit produces that in us. Now, we already know that. We've taken a lot of time to learn that. So you may be asking, okay, where do you get this idea of being chosen? Where did that come from? Because that doesn't sound super fruity, if you will. Well, John, everybody in John chapter 15, I want to read through this passage. Uh, this is my favorite passage. Now, Romans 5.8 is my favorite Bible verse, but as far as the whole passage goes, it's John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. And I love this passage. This is a very, very well-known passage. Is Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me, and you will bear much fruit. Now, there's a, a, a word in here, and I just said it, that word remain. We've got to watch for that word, remain. So you'll see that one if you're reading NIV, which is what I normally read. You're going to see the NIV up on the screen. If you're reading a different translation, which I am not a translation Nazi by any means, but a different translation may, may use the word abide. I love that word as well. We have that, that word on a plaque in our house. And both of those words mean to just remain or abide means to be constantly with, to live with, to stay with, to be in communion with, to, to have such fellowship with that you understand one another so well, like almost like you can think for the other person. That's what this word means. So here we go. John chapter 15, verse 1. Here's where we're going to land this fruit series. I am the true vine. Now, this is Jesus speaking. You've got to, got to picture this. This is called the upper room discourse, or this is a very small part of the upper room discourse. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. This is the Last Supper. He is about to, be, to go out into the garden to go pray. He will be arrested. He will be wrongfully tried, and he will be crucified right after this. And these are the, some of the last words that Jesus is saying to his disciples uh, right before his crucifixion. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the true vine. You are the branches. 
If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We just read that verse. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Now, it shifts just a little bit. Watch this, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's what? Friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made made known to you. Now, here's our key verse. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. You realize that verse says that God chose and appointed us. But I wanna, I wanna, I wanna make it a little bit more pointed. God chose and appointed you. And he chose and appointed me for some very, very specific things. Now, we may take that for granted, but again, is there really anything better that the God of the universe, the God who loves us so much that he realized we have sin in our lives and we will be eternally separated from him, that we messed up, and he does not want to be separated from us, He wants to be with us for all of eternity. So what did he do? He sent the very best thing he had, his son Jesus, to die for you. That very same God who loves you and loves me that much chose and appointed you and me. That ought to blow us away. But what's that mean to be chosen by God? This is where we take the big left-hand turn. This is where things might get a little bit contentious or a little bit tense. And I read through this and I was studying in this and God just kept bringing me back to this verse and pointing me at this verse. And I'm like, God, this doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the Fruit of the Spirit series. What a weird place to land. And he goes, "Uh uh-huh. Just trust me. So here we go. You guys ready? Now, some of you guys know where we're going with this. You're like, oh, great. If you don't, good for you, okay? There is a very, very big debate in the Christian world, in church world. And it is a thought or a difference between a couple of different types of theology, And I want to simply, simply keep the cookies on the bottom shelf, break them down for you a little bit. There is something called Calvinistic or Reformed theology, and there is something called Arminian theology. Now, again, I'm going to oversimplify this, okay? So you can come to me later. We can have a great discussion about it, but I'm going to make it super, super easy to understand. Calvinistic or Reformed theology basically says... God chose you ahead of time, you don't really have free will, and that you were the elect, you were appointed, and that that's it, you're, you're good, you're sealed, that's it. Arminian theology, on the other hand, is more like, hey, God gave us a choice and we get to choose whether or not to accept or reject God. 
Now, you're probably thinking, oh, okay, maybe I haven't heard them with those terms, but okay, that makes sense. So there's a lot of passages that you could look at that you can read a handful of verses or one or two verses and draw a conclusion one way or the other. But that's not the best way to look at Scripture. Like, for instance, there's uh, Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1. There's some of these passages where you can look at it and, and really draw a pretty good conclusion. But again, you have to look at the entirety of Scripture to see what exactly God is saying there. So here's what I did. I, I took, there's, there's a bunch of keywords. And when you hear these keywords, people are usually like, oh, there, there's one of those words. We have to be careful with this. So I'm just going to put them all out on the table. Here they are. We have keywords like election, predestined or predestination, choose or chosen, foreknowledge, and adoption is usually thrown in there as well. And so those are the big keywords that people like to use to steer you one way or another. So I have, just for fun, made a complete sentence with all of those keywords in there, and then I'm going to tell you what I really think that means. You guys ready? Here we go. In God's foreknowledge, that's the fact that God knows everything ahead of time before time even existed as we know it, before he created, he knew exactly everything. In God's foreknowledge, he predestined or chose the elect to be adopted into his family. Is that so clear for everybody? Okay, maybe I just, for fun, threw everything in there. What does that mean? Here's what I think that means. And here's what I believe. He knew, God knew, and chose exactly who would choose salvation through Jesus before the world began. Does that one make a little bit more sense? God knew in his foreknowledge, he, he knows everything. We can't trick him or surprise him. God knew who would choose him. I think it's a little more simple than we make it up to be. It doesn't mean that he only enables or chooses some people to be saved. Now, again, you can choose a handful of verses and steer it one way or the other, fine, okay? But does God actually do the saving and it really has nothing to do with us? Yes. If you think that you did anything to get saved or by your merit or whatever, I'm sorry you are sadly mistaken. You can't do anything to add to God's grace, his love, and his mercy. So it is God that does the saving. Do we have a choice to make? Absolutely. Now, here's some other scriptures to back it up. This is my favorite verse to use in this context. And this is Jesus speaking. It's Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, I have to explain what's going on here. Jesus is standing there with his disciples, and he's looking at the city of Jerusalem, which is also kind of a picture of Israel. And, and he's, he's basically crying out, he's saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, uh, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gather her chicks under her wings. Now pause just for a second. He's saying, Jerusalem, Israel, I've sent you prophets, I've sent you messengers, I've sent you people that like, I'm trying to show you that I am the Messiah, I was trying to reach you, I, I, I was trying to get you. And then he says, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. Anybody ever had chickens before? Okay, I had chickens, it was a weird COVID phase, okay, but I like eggs, so we had lots of eggs. We never had chicks though, but I've seen this before. If you get a mother hen and she's got chicks, mother hen's going to protect her chicks, isn't she? And, and they'll do this thing where they will put their, their wings out like this and they will literally gather their chicks in here. And, and, and mother hen is like this, like, come at me, come at me, bro. Like this, like, I will peck out your eyeballs if you come for one of my chicks, right? Have you guys, you, know, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? How cool is that, that that's the picture that Jesus used? 
And he's saying, just like a mother hen gathers her chicks and protects them, that's what I tried to do to you. And there's one little line on the end of this verse. What does it say? And you were not willing. Whoa. Does that sound like God does all the choosing? No, that sounds like maybe we have something to do with it, doesn't it? Okay, here's another passage. John chapter 6, verse 37. It says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. Now, that one kind of sounds like it's God doing the choosing, right? Look at the second half of the verse. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Now, we're back to sounding like we're choosing, right? So then it goes on, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Now we're back to sounding like God's doing the choosing. And then there's verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone, this, I love this verse, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Who does it sound like has to do the choosing there? That's back to us again. So it's, it's like, w- w- which one is it? It's both. It's both. Let me, let me give you a scenario to drive this home a little bit further. Because, again, the Calvinistic or Reformed person would say, and I, I, I'm not trying to call out anybody or anything, but they would say, some people just don't have a choice. And I just don't see that in Scripture. So here's a scenario. An unsaved unchosen or unelect person walked in the door this morning and they're sitting here right now and they're hearing about this awesome gracious God who loves them so much who fills the voids in their life that like like God's just like I I want to I want to protect you I want to gather you I want to I want to make a better life for you come to me I don't want you to spend eternity separated from me and, and this unsaved, unelected, unchosen person hears that and says, wow, I've never heard it like that before. I, I want Jesus. I, I want this Jesus that you're talking about, Trevor. And if they say that, is God going to say no to them? Is that a God that we read about in Scripture? I don't see that God in Scripture. It says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I think that's probably enough of that. But I want to say this. If you're still stuck one way or the other, I totally get it. You know what the really, really, really good news is? We don't have to part ways. This is not a salvation issue. This is what's called secondary doctrine or secondary theology. This isn't, oh, you know, you've got to believe this to go to heaven. It's not like that. You know what? It makes for really good, sometimes heated and debated conversations. But if you fall one way or the other on this, guess what? This is the place for you. Island Community Church is the place for you. Because again, we're not going to split hairs but we can have great conversations and you can show me where you think what scripture says and that's that. That's one of the great things I love about Island Community Church. So don't freak out when you see these big kind of buzzwords or when you have a conversation with somebody that falls on one side or the other. Be respectful, but that's how I feel that scripture says. That's how I feel God speaking to my spirit. Is that Is that clear? Everybody get that? Okay, that was fun, wasn't it? Okay, now, can it be both of those at the same time? Yes. God is sovereign. He chose us, and he chose who would choose him. I know it's kind of circular or redundant, but I just think that's how God works in his foreknowledge. So, now, back to our title, A Choosy God chooses you. Again, we should just stop at that and go, no way. 
He chose me. I don't deserve it. And you know what? You're right. You don't and I don't deserve it. And it's really, really, really good news that he has such mercy and such grace. But I want to dig into this choosy God thing, and the question is that I want to ask today, real simply, real fast, to wrap this up, why did God choose us? If, if, if this passage says that he chose us and other passages say he chose us like before the world even began, why? Because guess what? Again, I don't deserve it. So why would God Almighty choose me? Two reasons. There's many, many reasons. I want to look at two of them from our passage today. Number one, he chose us for friendship, which again, that's another no way moment right there. Look at verse 13. It says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, don't get too stuck up on this word command because a lot of people read that word and go, see, God's just about a bunch of rules. He wants to, to hold me down. He, he doesn't want me to have fun. Wrong. When he's talking about his commands, he's meaning, hey, I'm God and I set up life in a way that if you follow these simple rules, you're going to have such a, a, a better, more blessed, more joy-filled life. You're going to avoid a lot of the hardship and conflict and all the junk that we all get ourselves into. That's what God is saying here. He said, you're my friends if you do what I command. Like, like live how I'm trying to tell you how to live. And that's all right here in this book right here. Verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And then here's our key verse. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now question, is that normally how friendships work? Like, you're like, you know what? I think I would like that person. Hey, you're my friend. That would be a little odd, wouldn't it? That's not how friendships work. Normally, it's a, a mutual agreement, right? That you, you, you have to come together, spend some time. Oh, we have some things in common, and you develop a friendship. But let me ask you this. If someone of God's status, ability, worth chose you as a friend what could be the only possible motivation that there is for god to choose you as a friend is it because he needs something from you is it because you have something to bring to the table in this friendship is it because you earned it you deserve it? Nope. What could be the only possible reason that God would choose you as a friend? It's very simple. Love. That's it. That's the only reason why God would choose us to be friends. Because he loves us that much. Again, another no way moment creator, sustainer of all things, loves you enough to want to be friends with you. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says, it's a good thing God chose me before I was born because he surely would not have afterwards. <laughs> Pretty true, isn't it? Yeah. Now, what are, what are some values and characteristics of friendship? What do you think? Like communion, doing life together, love, trust. Trust is kind of important for friendships, right? Um, how about mutual benefits, like a symbiotic relationship, if we want to go into science a little bit, not a parasitic relationship. Anybody have parasitic friends? Do not raise your hands, okay? You might be sitting next to them right now. 
but a mutualistic relationship where it benefits the both of you. Uh, friendships have conversation. You talk to each other. You, you do life with each other. And you want the best for each other, right? That's what a friendship is. And that's what God wants with us. I, I just, I, I've, I've said it so many times this week in studying and reading this, and I still, like, it just keeps hitting me, like, why? Why? Why do you want that with me, God? I know me, and if I know me, you surely know me. And I'm not a great friend. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, I have told you this, and he, what he's referring to is remain or abide in me. Be close with me. Be friends with me. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may complete may be complete. Jesus is saying, I I want you to be close to me so that you will have joy. And and, and I I did some research on this. You know when it says, and that your joy may be complete, when you look up that word complete in the Greek, it means filled to capacity. Like God wants us to have so much joy in this life, not happiness, because you can buy happiness, but you can't buy joy. But God wants us to have so much joy in our lives that we are completely full. We're we're complete. There is no room for anything else in our lives but joy. And that's what God wants for us. Why? We don't deserve it, do we? Why? Because he is a good, good God. So why did he choose us? Number one, God chose us for friendship. And the other one, here's where we land this series. God chose us for bearing fruit. God chose us so that we can bear fruit in our lives. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, here we go, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. We have a responsibility to bear fruit, to produce fruit as followers and as friends of God. That is what we are called to do. And we look at our passage, John 15, verses 1 through 17, and at least eight times it tells us in there, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. I think if something is is said one time by Jesus, that's good enough. If it's repeated that means it's pretty important. If it's said at least eight times, I would think, yeah, that's, Jesus is on to something there, that he wants us to do something to bear fruit. And we need to bear it. If you remember, the very first week, we talked about five different types of fruit. The, the first one was the virtue fruit. That was the love, joy, peace, forbearance, those, the, the fruit of the Spirit. We need to bear the virtue fruit so that we can bear the multiplication fruit. Because church, we have a responsibility. We have the greatest news ever, right? But are we supposed to keep that within us? Like there's this God that he wants to love people and save people and fill them up with joy. Are we supposed to keep that to ourselves? No, we're supposed to charge outside of these doors and tell people. We are mandated to do that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 19, and we'll close with this. Jesus is leaving the earth. He is about to literally rocket ship off of the earth. And his last words to his disciples are this. It says, then the 11 disciples, there's only 11 because Judas, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, here's his parting words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, that's a line that we don't have time to theologically go into, but that's a big deal right there. So then he says, therefore, I said that to say this right here, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
It's a mandate, church. We don't get to have this really, really, really good news and keep it within us. And, well, I don't, I'm not comfortable with sharing my faith, or I don't know enough Bible verses, or I don't know. No. All you have to do is share what God has done in your life. You don't have to go quote a whole bunch of verses, although that helps. You, you want to know a really, really easy way to do it? Just bring them here. I'll do the heavy lifting for you. Just maybe take them to lunch or something, okay? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So why did God choose us? Number one, God chose us for friendship. That's motivation. And number two, God chose us for fruit. So lately, we've been closing with a little memorable prayer that you guys can take with you and pray throughout the week. Here it is. God, help me to use the motivation of your friendship to bear fruit in my life. Help me to use the motivation of, of no way, God, you want to be a friend with me? Like, that's how good you are? I, I, I've got to share that. I've got to share that with a lost, dying, broken world. That's a responsibility and a mandate that we have. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you are so good, that you desire friendship with us, that you, you call us friends. And God, we turn our backs on you. God, we sin against you. We, we, we bring shame to your name, even as, as Christians we do, God, and you still forgive and forgive and forgive. You are so good, Lord. God, help us to be motivated by the desire that you have to be friends with us, to just to take that motivation, to, to know that you are such a good and gracious God and to go share that with this world. Help us to heed that mandate, Lord. Help us to not keep the best news ever to ourselves. God, give us courage. Give us strength. And help us to believe that you want to be our friends. And if there are some here this morning who can't honestly say that you would call God your friend, I want to give you an opportunity for that this morning. He wants to be your friend. He wants to call you a son or a daughter. He wants to step into your life and bring joy to fill those gaps and those voids, the things that you have searched for for so long. God wants to fill those holes. So if that's you this morning, if you don't think you've got a relationship with Jesus right now, just say, I want to give my life to you, Lord. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he took away my sin, took that sin to the cross, raised again three days later. God, help me to live my life for you in exchange. Be my savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, this morning I got it right for the first time. I started a relationship with Jesus today. Make him Lord and Savior of my life. God, thank you that you are so good. Thank you that you call us friends. Thank you that we can trust you no matter what and that you desire to have relationship with us. God, help us to be a force in this community, in this world that will do things that will matter in 10,000 years. God, we pray for this time of offering 
Bless it, Lord. Use it. God, help us to be wise. And God, help us to further your kingdom in any way that we can. God, we lift up the boat show as it's going on right now. God, would you just bring people through those doors, not just so that we can raise money, but so that we can raise money, and we know that that will be used 100% to further your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you are good. And we pray all of this in your awesome, amazing name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm-hmm.